the Japanese Fairy Tale Series, numbers 1 through 10. Published by Takajiro Hasegawa. Translations by David Thompson, James Hepburn, Mrs. T. H. James, and Basil Hall Chamberlain. Illustrated by Eitaku Sensei. Read by number one Marmaduke fan. Number one, Momotaro, or The Little Peachling. A long, long time ago, there lived an old man and an old woman. One day, the old man went to the mountains to cut grass, and the old woman went to the river to wash clothes. While she was washing, a great big thing came tumbling and splashing down the stream. When the old woman saw it, she was very glad and pulled it to her with a piece of bamboo that lay nearby. When she took it up and looked at it, she saw that it was a very large peach. She then quickly finished her washing and returned home, intending to give the peach to her old man to eat. When she cut the peach in two, out came a child from the large kernel. Seeing this, the old couple rejoiced and named the child Momotaro, or Little Peachling, because he came out of a peach. As both the old people took good care of him, he grew and became strong and enterprising. So the old couple had their expectations raised and bestowed still more care on his education. Momotaro, finding that he excelled everybody in strength, determined to cross over to the island of the devils, take their riches, and come back. He at once consulted with the old man and the old woman about the matter and got them to make him some dumplings. These he put in his pouch. Besides this, he made every kind of preparation for his journey to the island of the devils and set out. Then first a dog came to the side of the way and said, Momotaro, what have you there hanging at your belt? He replied, I have some of the very best Japanese mille dumplings. Give me one and I will go with you, said the dog. So Momotaro took a dumpling out of his pouch and gave it to the dog. Then a monkey came and got one the same way. A pheasant also came flying and said, Hru, Give me a dumpling too, and I will go along with you. Hru. So all three went along with him. In no time they arrived at the island of the devils, and at once broke through the front gate, Momotaro first, then his three followers. Here they met a great multitude of the devil's retainers, who showed fight, but they still pressed inwards, and at last encountered the chief of the devils, called Akan Doji. Then came the tug of war. Akan Doji made at Momotaro with an iron club, but Momotaro was ready for him, and dodged adroitly. At last they grappled each other, and without difficulty, Momotaro just crushed down Akandoji and tied him with a rope so tight that he could not even move. All this was done in a fair fight. After this, Akandoji, the chief of the devils, said he would surrender all his riches. Out with your riches, then, said Momotaro, laughing. Having collected and ranged in order a great pile of precious things, Momotaro took them and set out for his home, rejoicing as he marched bravely back, that, with the help of his three companions, to whom he attributed all his success, he had been able so easily to accomplish his end. Great was the joy of the old man and the old woman when Momotaro came back. He feasted everybody bountifully, told many stories of his adventure, displayed his riches, and at last became a leading man, a man of influence, very rich and honorable. A man to be very much congratulated indeed. The End Number 2. Shitakire Suzume, or The Tongue-Cut Sparrow It is said that once upon a time, a cross old woman laid some starch in a basin, intending to put it in the clothes in her wash tub, but a sparrow that a woman her neighbor kept as a pet added up. Seeing this, the cross old woman seized the sparrow, and saying, You hateful thing! cut its tongue and let it go. When the neighbor woman heard that her pet sparrow had got its tongue cut for its offense, she was greatly grieved, and set out with her husband over mountains and plains to find where it had gone, crying, Where does the tongue cut sparrow stay? Where does the tongue cut sparrow stay? At last they found its home. When the sparrow saw that its old master and mistress had come to see it, it rejoiced and brought them into its house and thanked them for their kindness in old times, and spread a table for them, and loaded it with sake and fish till there was no more room, and made its wife and children and grandchildren all serve the table. 
At last, throwing away its drinking cup, it danced a jig called the Sparrow's Dance. Thus they spent the day. When it began to grow dark and they began to talk of going home, the sparrow brought out two wicker baskets and said, Will you take the heavy one, or shall I give you the light one? The old people replied, We are old, so give us the light one. It will be easier to carry it. The sparrow then gave them the light basket, and they returned with it to their home. Let us open and see what is in it, they said. And when they had opened it and looked, they found gold and silver and jewels and rolls of silk. They never expected anything like this. The more they took out, the more they found inside. The supply was inexhaustible. So that house at once became rich and prosperous. When the cross old woman who had cut the sparrow's tongue saw this, she was filled with envy, and went and asked her neighbor where the sparrow lived, and all about the way. I will go too, she said, and at once set out on her search. Again the sparrow brought out two wicker baskets, and asked as before, Will you take the heavy one, or shall I give you the light one? Thinking the treasure would be great in proportion to the weight of the basket, the old woman replied, Let me have the heavy one. Receiving this, she started home with it on her back, the sparrows laughing at her as she went. It was as heavy as a stone and hard to carry, but at last she got back with it to her house. Then, when she took off the lid and looked in, a whole troop of frightful devils came bouncing out from the inside, and at once tore the old woman to pieces. The End Number 3. Sarukani Kassen, or Battle of the Monkey and the Crab A monkey and a crab once met when going round a mountain. The monkey had picked up a persimmon seed, and the crab had a piece of toasted rice cake, the monkey, seeing this, and wishing to get something that could be turned to good account at once, said, Pray, exchange that rice cake for this persimmon seed. The crab, without saying a word, gave up his cake, and took the persimmon seed and planted it. At once it sprung up, and soon became a tree so high one had to look up at it. The tree was full of persimmons, but the crab had no means of climbing the tree. So he asked the monkey to climb up and get the persimmons for him. The monkey got up on a limb of the tree and began to eat the persimmons. The unripe persimmons he threw at the crab, but all the ripe and good ones he put in his pouch. The crab under the tree thus got his shell badly bruised and only by good luck escaped into his hole, where he lay distressed with pain and not able to get up. Now when the relatives and household of the crab heard how matters stood, they were surprised and angry and declared war, and attacked the monkey, who, leading forth a numerous following, bid defiance to the other party. The crabs, finding themselves unable to meet and cope with this force, became still more exasperated and enraged, and retreated into their hole and held a council of war. Then came a rice mortar, a pounder, a bee, and an egg, and together they devised a deep-laid plot to be avenged. First, they requested that peace be made with the crabs, and thus they induced the king of the monkeys to enter their hole unattended and seated him on the hearth. The monkey, not suspecting any plot, took the hibashi, or poker, to stir up the slumbering fire, when bang went the egg, which was lying hidden in the ashes, and burned the monkey's arm. Surprised and alarmed, he plunged his arm into the pickle tub in the kitchen to relieve the pain of the burn. Then the bee, which was hidden near the tub, stung him sharply in his face, already wet with tears. Without waiting to brush off the bee and howling bitterly, he rushed for the back door, but just then some seaweed entangled his legs and made him slip. Then down came the pounder, tumbling on him from a shelf, and the mortar too came rolling down on him from the roof of the pouch, and broke his back, and so weakened him that he was unable to rise up. Then out came the crabs in a crowd, and brandishing on high their pinchers, they pinched the monkey to pieces. The End <laughs> Number 4. Hanasaki Jiji, or The Old Man Who Made the Dead Trees Blossom Once upon a time, there was a kind old couple that kept a pet dog. One day the old man dug where the dog scratched and unexpectedly found a quantity of gold. Now there was a bad-hearted couple, their neighbors, who envied them their good fortune and asked them to lend their dog. 
as they would take no refusal. They got the dog, but when they took him along the road, he would not scratch the ground. Therefore, they made him scratch, and then dug where he scratched. But instead of finding gold, they only found a lot of filthy stuff. Then they got angry and killed the dog, and buried him under a small pine tree by the wayside. The pine tree suddenly grew to a great size, and the kind old man cut it down and made a mortar out of the wood. When he pounded barley in that mortar, the barley would flow up out of the bottom and overflow without end. His neighbor again envied him, and borrowed his mortar to pound his barley in. But when he did so, his barley all turned out cracked and worm-eaten. Then he became still more enraged, and broke the mortar to pieces and used it for firewood. The kind old man then took some of the ashes of the mortar and scattered them on dead trees, and made them blossom. He was plentifully rewarded for this with gold, silver, and pieces of silk by the prince of the country. And so he came to be called the old man who made dead trees blossom. Again his neighbor envied him and attempted to make dead trees blossom with the ashes. But when he took a handful and sprinkled it on the limbs of a dead tree, the tree did not blossom. But the ashes blew into the eyes of the prince of the country. The retainers of the prince roared out, That's a nice state of things, and seized the old man, and all hands gave him a sore beating. With his head bruised and bloody, he barely escaped. In this condition, his wife saw him returning in the distance. My husband, too, I see, has been rewarded by the prince with purple garments, she said. But while she was thus rejoicing, he came near when she looked more closely and saw that her husband, instead of being clothed in purple, was stained with blood. As to the man, he then took to his bed sick, and at last died. The End Number 5. Kachi Kachi Yama, or Kachi Kachi Mountain Once upon a time, there was an old farmer who cultivated a field in the mountains, one day, his old wife came and brought him his dinner, but a badger stole an edit. This made the old man angry, and at last he took the badger alive, carried it home with him, and hung it to a rafter by the feet. Then he said to his wife, Let us have this badger for soup. Have it well cooked and wait till I come back. Then he went again to the field. His wife was pounding barley in a mortar and singing. In distress, the badger said, if you will only spare my life, I will pound the barley for you. As it was indeed in a sad plight, she untied the cord and let it down. Then right away the badger sprang at the old woman and killed her and made her into soup. Then he assumed her shape and sat waiting when the old man returned from the field. When he was about to partake of the soup, the badger assumed his original form and cried out, you wife-eating old man, you! Did you not see the bones under the floor? Laughing derisively, it escaped out of doors and disappeared. The old man threw down his chopsticks and cried long and bitterly. Now in the same mountain, there lived an old rabbit. Hearing the voice of the old man crying, he came and tried to comfort him, and said he himself would avenge the death of the old woman. First, he said, parch me some beans and the old man parched them. The rabbit put the parched beans in a pouch and said, Now to the mountain again. And away he went. The badger was attracted by the smell and came and said, Give me about a handful of those beans. This was what the rabbit was expecting. So he said, I will, if you will carry a bundle of dry grass for me over to yon mountain. I will do as you say without fail, replied the badger, only first give me the beans. He begged importunately, but the rabbit said, Yes, after you have carried the load of dry grass. He then put on his back a great pile of dried grass and sent the badger on before, while he took out his flint and struck out a spark and set the bundle on fire. The badger, alarmed at the noise, asked, What is that? The rabbit replied, that is Kachi Kachi Mountain. This means Click Click Mountain, or the Mountain of Victory. Soon the fire began to kindle and spread in the dried grass. The badger, hearing this, again asked, 
What is that? The rabbit replied, That is Bobo Mountain. This means Crackle Mountain, or Mountain of Defeat. By this time, the fire had spread to the badger's back and burnt it badly. Crying out in pain, he rolled over and shook off his load and ran away out of sight. The rabbit next mixed some sauce and red pepper and made a sticking plaster, put on a hat, and set out to sell it as a cure for blisters and burns. The badger was then lying helpless, with his back all raw and sore. That must be a good medicine, he thought when he heard of it. So he got some applied to his back. But there is no language to tell how he smarted when the red pepper sticking plaster was applied to his sore skin. He just rolled over and over and howled long and bitterly. Now, after about 20 days, the badger's sore was healed. The rabbit was then making a boat, and the badger, seeing it, asked, What are you going to do with this boat? The rabbit replied, I intend to catch fish, thus deceiving. The badger felt envious, but was dull in that kind of work. I will make a boat of clay, he said. So having made a clay boat, he rowed out to sea along with the rabbit. Then the badger's boat began to sink, and when it was sinking, the rabbit brandished aloft his oar and struck the badger dead, thus avenging the old man's wife. The End Number 6. Nezumi no Yomeire, or The Mouse's Wedding A long time ago, there was a white mouse called Kanemochi, servant of Daikoku, the god of wealth. His wife's name was Onaga. Both Kanemochi and his wife were very discreet. Never in the daytime, nor even at night, did they venture into the parlor or kitchen, and so they lived in tranquility, free from danger of meeting the cat. Their only son, Fukutaro, also was of a gentle disposition. When he was old enough to take a wife, his parents concluded to get him one, transfer their property to him, and seek retirement. Fortunately, one of their relatives named Chudayu had a lovely daughter named Hatsuka. Accordingly, a go-between was employed to enter into negotiations with Chudayu, respecting the marriage. When the young folks were allowed to see each other, neither party objected, and so, presents were exchanged. The bride's groom sent the bride the usual articles, an obi, or belt, silk cotton, dried bonito, dried cuttlefish, white flax, seaweed, and sake, or rice wine. The bride sent the bridegroom in like manner, a linen kamishimo, dried bonito, dried cuttlefish, white flax, seaweed, fish, and sake, thus confirming the marriage promise. A lucky day was then chosen, and everything prepared for the bride's removal to her new home. Her clothes were cut out and made, and needed articles purchased. So, Chudayu was kept busy preparing for the wedding. The parents made their daughter Hatsuka blacken her teeth as a sign that she would not marry a second husband. They also carefully taught her that she must obey her husband, be dutiful to her father-in-law, and love her mother-in-law. Kanemochi, on his part, cleaned up his house inside and out, made preparation for the marriage ceremony and feast, assembled his relatives and friends, and sent out many of his servants to meet the bride on her way, and to give notice of her approach, that all might be prepared for her reception. Soon the bride came in her palanquin, with her boxes carried before her, and a long train of attendants following her. Kanemochi went out as far as the gate to meet her, and ushered her into the parlor, at a signal from the go-between, the bride and bridegroom, to confirm the marriage bond, exchanged between themselves three cups of sake, drinking three times from each cup in turns. When the ceremony, called the three times three, was ended, the guests exchanged cups with the bride in token of goodwill, and thus the union was consummated. Shortly afterwards, the bride, her husband, and his parents visited her home. In the evening, the bride returned home with her husband and his parents, with whom she lived in harmony, contented, prosperous, and happy, and much to be congratulated. The End Number 7. Kobutori, or The Old Man and the Devils A long time ago, there was an old man who had a big lump on the right side of his face. One day, he went into the mountain to cut wood, 
when the rain began to pour and the wind to blow so very hard that finding it impossible to return home and filled with fear, he took refuge in the hollow of an old tree. While sitting there doubled up and unable to sleep, he heard the confused sound of many voices in the distance gradually approaching to where he was. He said to himself, How strange! I thought I was all alone in the mountain, but I hear the voices of many people. So, taking courage, he peeped out and saw a great crowd of strange-looking beings. Some were red and dressed in green clothes. Others were black and dressed in red clothes. Some had only one eye. Others had no mouth. Indeed, it was quite impossible to describe their varied and strange looks. They kindled a fire, so that it became as right as day. They sat down in two cross rows and began to drink wine and make merry, just like human beings. They passed the wine cup around so often that many of them became very drunk. One of the young devils got up and began to sing a merry song and to dance, so also many others. Some danced well, others badly. One said, We have had uncommon fun tonight, but I would like to see something new. The old man, losing all fear, thought he would like to dance, and saying, Let come what will, if I die for it, I will have a dance too, crept out of the hollow tree, and with his cap slipped over his nose and his axe sticking in his belt, began to dance. The devils, in great surprise, jumped up, saying, Who is this? But the old man, advancing and receding, swaying to and fro, and posturing this way and that way, the whole crowd laughed and enjoyed the fun, saying, How well the old man dances! You must always come and join us in our sport. But for fear you might not come, you must give us a pledge that you will. So the devils consulted together, and agreeing that the lump on his face, which was a token of wealth, was what he valued most highly, demanded that it should be taken. The old man replied, I have had this lump many years, and would not without good reason part with it. But you may have it, or an eye, or my nose, either if you wish. So the devils laid hold of it, twisting and pulling, and took it off without giving him any pain, and put it away as a pledge that he would come back. Just then the day began to dawn, and the birds to sing, so the devils hurried away. The old man felt his face and found it quite smooth and not a trace of the lump left. He forgot all about cutting wood and hastened home. His wife, seeing him, exclaimed in great surprise, What has happened to you? So he told her all that had befallen him. Now among the neighbors there was another old man who had a big lump on the left side of his face. Hearing all about how the old man had got rid of his lump, he determined that he would also try the same plan to get rid of his lump. So he went and crept into the hollow tree and waited for the devils to come. Sure enough, they came just as he was told. They sat down, drank wine, and made merry just as they did before. The old man, afraid and trembling, crept out of the hollow tree. The devils welcomed him, saying, The old man has come. Now let us see him dance. This old man was awkward and did not dance as well as the other. So the devils cried out, you dance badly and are getting worse and worse. We will give you back the lump which we took from you as a pledge. Upon this, one of the devils brought the lump and stuck it on the other side of his face. So the old man returned home with a lump on each side of his face. The End Number 8. Urashima, or The Fisher Boy Urashima Long, long ago, there lived on the coast of the Sea of Japan a young fisherman named Urashima, a kindly lad and clever with his rod and line. Well, one day he went out in his boat to fish, but instead of catching any fish, what do you think he caught? Why, a great big tortoise with a hard shell and such a funny wrinkled old face and a tiny tail. Now I must tell you something which very likely you don't know and that is that tortoises always live a thousand years. At least Japanese tortoises do. So Urashima thought to himself, a fish would do for my dinner just as well as this tortoise. In fact, better. Why should I go and kill the poor thing and prevent it from enjoying itself another 999 years? No, no, I won't be so cruel. I'm sure mother wouldn't like me to. And with these words, he threw the tortoise back into the sea. 
The next thing that happened was that Urashima went to sleep in his boat, for it was one of those hot summer days when almost everybody enjoys a nap of an afternoon. And as he slept, there came up from beneath the waves a beautiful girl, who got into the boat and said, I am the daughter of the sea god, and I live with my father in the dragon palace beyond the waves. It was not a tortoise that you caught just now, and so kindly threw back into the water instead of killing it. It was myself. My father the sea god had sent me to see whether you were good or bad. We now know that you are a good, kind boy who doesn't like to do cruel things, and so I have come to fetch you. You shall marry me if you like, and we will live happily together for a thousand years in the dragon palace beyond the deep blue sea. So Urashima took one oar, and the sea god's daughter took the other, and they rowed, and they rowed, and they rowed, till at last they came to the dragon palace, where the sea god lived and ruled as king over all the dragons and the tortoises and the fishes. Oh dear, what a lovely place it was! The walls of the palace were of coral, the trees had emeralds for leaves and rubies for berries, the fish's scales were of silver, and the dragon's tails of solid gold. Just think of the most beautiful, glittering things that you have ever seen, and put them all together, and then you will know what this palace looked like, and it all belonged to Urashima. For was he not the son-in-law of the sea god, the husband of the lovely dragon princess? Well, they lived on happily for three years, wandering about every day among the beautiful trees with emerald leaves and ruby berries. But one morning, Urashima said to his wife, I am very happy here. Still, I want to go home and see my father and mother and brothers and sisters. Just let me go for a short time, and I'll soon be back again. I don't like you to go, said she. I am very much afraid that something dreadful will happen. However, if you will go, there is no help for it. Only you must take this box, and be very careful not to open it. If you open it, you will never be able to come back here. So Urashima promised to take great care of the box, and not to open it on any account, and then, getting into his boat, he rowed off, and at last landed on the shore of his own country. But what had happened while he had been away? Where had his father's cottage gone to? What had become of the village where he used to live? The mountains indeed were there as before, but the trees on them had been cut down. The little brook that ran close by his father's cottage was still running, but there were no women washing clothes in it anymore. It seemed very strange that everything should have changed so much in three short years. So as two men chanced to pass along the beach, Urashima went up to them and said, Can you tell me please where Urashima's cottage that used to stand here has been moved to? Urashima, said they. Why, it was four hundred years ago that he was drowned out fishing. His parents and his brothers and their grandchildren are all dead long ago. It is an old, old story. How can you be so foolish as to ask after his cottage? It fell to pieces hundreds of years ago. Then it suddenly flashed across Urashima's mind that the sea god's palace beyond the waves, with its coral walls and its ruby fruits and its dragons with tails of solid gold, must be part of fairyland, and that one day there was probably as long as a year in this world, so that his three years in the sea god's palace had really been hundreds of years. Of course, there was no use in staying at home, now that all his friends were dead and buried, and even the village had passed away. So Urashima was in a great hurry to get back to his wife, the dragon princess beyond the sea. But which was the way? He couldn't find it with no one to show him. Perhaps, thought he, if I open the box which she gave me, I shall be able to find the way. So he disobeyed her orders not to open the box. Or perhaps he forgot them, foolish boy that he was. Anyhow, he opened the box, and what do you think came out of it? Nothing but a white cloud which floated away over the sea. Urashima shouted to the cloud to stop, rushed about and screamed with sorrow, for he remembered now what his wife had told him, and how, after opening the box, he should never be able to go to the sea god's palace again. But soon he could neither run nor shout any more. Suddenly his hair grew as white as snow, his face got wrinkled, and his back bent like that of a very old man. Then his breath stopped short, and he fell down dead on the beach. Poor Urashima. He died because he had been foolish and disobedient. If only he had done as he was told, he might have lived another thousand years. Wouldn't you like to go and see the dragon palace beyond the waves, 
where the sea god lives and rules as king, over the dragons and the tortoises and the fishes, where the trees have emeralds for leaves and rubies for berries, where the fishes' tails are of silver and the dragons' tails all of solid gold. The End Number 9. Yamata no Orochi, or The Serpent with Eight Heads Did you ever hear the story of the eight-headed serpent? If not, I will tell it to you. It is rather a long one, and we must go a good way back to get to the beginning of it. In fact, we must go back to the beginning of the world. After the world had been created, it became the property of a very powerful fairy. And when this fairy was about to die, he divided it between his two boys and his girl. The girl, called Ama, was given the sun. The eldest boy, called Susano, was given the sea. And the second boy, whose name I forget, was given the moon. Well, the moon boy behaved himself properly, and you can still see his jolly round face on a clear night when the moon is full. But Susano was very angry and disappointed at having nothing but the cold, wet sea to live in. So up he rushed into the sky, burst into the beautiful room inside the sun, where his sister was sitting with her maidens, weaving gold and silver dresses, broke their spindles, trampled upon their work, and in short did all the mischief he could, and frightened the poor maids to death. As for Ama, she ran away as fast as she could, and hid herself in a cave on the side of a mountain full of rocks and crags. When she had gotten to the cave and had shut the door, the whole world became pitch dark. For she was the fairy who ruled the sun, and could make it shine or not as she chose. In fact, some people say that the light of the sun is really nothing else than the brightness of her own bright eyes. Anyhow, there was a great trouble over her disappearance. What was to be done to make the world light again? All sorts of plans were tried. At last, knowing that she was curious and always liked to see everything that was going on, the other fairies got up a dance outside the door of the cave. When Amma heard the noise of the dancing and singing and laughing, she could not help opening the door a tiny bit in order to peep through the chink at the fun the other fairies were having. This was just what they had been watching for. Look here, cried they. Look at this new fairy more beautiful than yourself. And therewith they thrust forward a mirror. Amma did not know that the face in the mirror was only the reflection of her own. And, more and more curious to know who the new fairy could be, she ventured outside the door, where she was caught hold of by the other fairies, who piled up the entrance of the cave with big rocks so that no one could ever go into it again. Seeing that she had been tricked into coming out of the cave, and that there was no use in sulking any longer, Amma agreed to go back to the sun and shine upon the world as before, provided her brother were punished and sent away in disgrace for really he was not safe to live with. This was done. Susa was beaten to within an inch of his life and expelled from the society of the other fairies, with orders never to show himself again. So poor Susa, having been turned out of fairyland, was obliged to come down to the earth. While walking one day on the bank of a river, he happened to see an old man and an old woman with their arms round their young daughter and crying bitterly. What is the matter? asked Susa. Oh, said they, their voice choked with sobs. We used to have eight daughters, but in a marsh near our hut there lives a huge eight-headed serpent who comes out once every year and eats one of them up. We have now only one daughter left, and today is the day when the serpent will come to eat her, and then we shall have none. Please, good sir, can you not do something to help us? Of course, answered Susa. It will be quite easy. Do not be sad any longer. I am a fairy, and I will save your daughter. So he told them to brew some beer, and showed them how to make a fence with eight gates in it, and a wooden stand inside each gate, and a large vat of beer on each stand. This they did, and just as all had been arranged in the way Susa had bidden them, the serpent came. So huge was he that his body trained over eight hills and eight valleys as he wriggled along. But as he had eight heads, he also had eight noses, which made him able to smell eight times as quickly as any other creature. So, smelling the beer from afar off, 
he at once glided towards it, went inside the fence, dipped one of his heads into each of the eight vats, and drank and drank and drank till he got quite tipsy. Then all of his heads dropped down fast asleep, and Susa, jumping up from the hole where he had hidden, drew his sword and cut them all off. He cut the body to pieces too. But, strange to say, when cutting the tail, the blade of his sword snapped. It had struck against something hard. As the serpent was now dead, there was no danger in going up to it and finding out what the hard thing was. It turned out to be itself a sword, all set with precious stones, the most beautiful sword you ever saw. Susa took the sword and married the beautiful young girl, and he was very kind to her, although he had been so rude to his elder sister. They spent the rest of their lives in a beautiful palace, which was built on purpose for them, and the old father and mother lived there too. When the old father and mother and Susa and his wife had all died, the sword was handed down to their children and grandchildren, and it now belongs to the Emperor of Japan, who looks upon it as one of his most precious treasures. The End Number 10. Matsuyama Kagami or the Matsuyama Mirror. The Matsuyama Mirror. A long time ago, there lived in a quiet spot a young man and his wife. They had one child, a little daughter, whom they both loved with all their hearts. I cannot tell you their names, for they have been long since forgotten, but the name of the place where they lived was Matsuyama, in the province of Echigo. It happened once, when the little girl was still a baby, that the father was obliged to go to the great city, the capital of Japan, upon some business. It was too far for the mother and her little baby to go, so he set out alone, after bidding them goodbye and promising to bring them home some pretty present. The mother had never been further from home than the next village, and she could not help being a little frightened at the thought of her husband taking such a long journey. And yet she was a little proud, too, for he was the first man in all that countryside who had been to the big town where the king and his great lords lived, and where there were so many beautiful and curious things to be seen. At last, the time came when she might expect her husband back, so she dressed the baby in its best clothes and herself put on a pretty blue dress, which she knew her husband liked. You may fancy how glad this good wife was to see him come home safe and sound, and how the little girl clapped her hands and laughed with delight when she saw the pretty toys her father had brought for her. He had much to tell of all the wonderful things he had seen upon the journey and in the town itself. I have brought you a very pretty thing, said he to his wife. It is called a mirror. Look and tell me what you see inside. He gave to her a plain white wooden box, in which, when she opened it, she found a round piece of metal. One side was white, like frosted silver, and ornamented with raised figures of birds and flowers. The other was bright as the clearest crystal. Into it the young mother looked with delight and astonishment, for, from its depths, was looking at her with parted lips and bright eyes, a smiling, happy face. "'What do you see?' again asked the husband, pleased at her astonishment, and glad to show that he had learned something while he had been away. "'I see a pretty woman looking at me, and she moves her lips as if she was speaking. And, dear me, how odd, she has on a blue dress just like mine.' "'Why, you silly woman, it is your own face that you see,' said the husband, proud of knowing something that his wife didn't know. "'That round piece of metal is called a mirror,' In the town, everybody has one, although we have not seen them in this country place before. The wife was charmed with her present, and, for a few days, could not look into the mirror often enough. For you must remember that, as this was the first time she had seen a mirror, so, of course, it was the first time she had ever seen the reflection of her own pretty face. But she considered such a wonderful thing far too precious for everyday use and soon shut it up in its box again, and put it away carefully among her most valued treasures. Years passed on, and the husband and wife still lived happily. The joy of their life was their little daughter, who grew up the very image of her mother, and who was so dutiful and affectionate that everybody loved her. Mindful of her own little passing vanity on finding herself so lovely, the mother kept the mirror carefully hidden away, 
fearing that the use of it might breed a spirit of pride in her little girl. She never spoke of it, and as for the father, he had forgotten all about it. So it happened that the daughter grew up as simple as the mother had been, and knew nothing of her own good looks, or of the mirror which would have reflected them. But by and by, a terrible misfortune happened to this happy little family. The good, kind mother fell sick, and although her daughter waited upon her day and night with loving care, she got worse and worse, until at last there was no hope but that she must die. When she found that she must so soon leave her husband and child, the poor woman felt very sorrowful, grieving for those she was going to leave behind, and most of all for her little daughter. She called the girl to her and said, My darling child, you know that I am very sick. Soon I must die and leave your dear father and you alone. When I am gone, promise me that you will look into this mirror every night and every morning. There you will see me and know that I am still watching over you. With these words, she took the mirror from its hiding place and gave it to her daughter. The child promised with many tears, and so the mother, seeming now calm and resigned, died a short time after. Now this obedient and dutiful daughter never forgot her mother's last request, but each morning and evening took the mirror from its hiding place and looked in it long and earnestly. There she saw the bright and smiling vision of her lost mother, not pale and sickly as in her last days, but the beautiful young mother of long ago. To her at night she told the story of the trials and difficulties of the day. To her in the morning she looked for sympathy and encouragement in whatever might be in store for her. So day by day she lived as in her mother's sight, striving still to please her as she had done in her lifetime, and careful always to avoid whatever might pain or grieve her. Her greatest joy was to be able to look in the mirror and say, Mother, I have been today what you would have me to be. Seeing her every night and morning, without fail, look into the mirror and seem to hold converse with it, her father at length asked her the reason of her strange behavior. Father, she said, I look into the mirror every day to see my dear mother and to talk with her. Then she told him of her mother's dying wish, and how she had never failed to fulfill it. Touched by so much simplicity and such faithful, loving obedience, the father shed tears of pity and affection. Nor could he find it in his heart to tell the child that the image she saw in the mirror was but the reflection of her own sweet face, by constant sympathy and association, becoming more and more like her dead mother's, day by day. The End to hear more stories in the Japanese fairy tale series, click the link to the playlist in the description below. Thank you for listening. You can support this channel by liking this video, sharing your thoughts in a comment, subscribing, and clicking the bell to receive notifications of future videos in this series, and by supporting me on Subscribestar. Thank you to everyone who has supported this channel. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys, and I will catch you later.